Well, this morning we are continuing that series through the Bible called From Tree to Tree to Tree. And today we are looking at Daniel and specifically the intersection of faith and culture. Now, just to, to remind you of some context for this, two weeks ago we looked at Solomon, and at the end of Solomon's life, we, we saw that the nation of Israel was split in two. There were 10 northern tribes called Israel, and the two southern tribes now called Judah. And the 10 northern tribes, uh, none of them were good. They chased after other gods. And last week we heard about Elijah, who was representative of the prophets that went to speak to them. And what happened in, in 722 BC, the Assyrian Empire came in. It was the world power at that time and just swallowed up the 10 northern tribes. And the Assyrians, what they would do is when they captured a nation, they would disperse them all throughout their empire and then bring other people back in from other places they'd conquered to inhabit the area. They were trying to limit revolts and stuff like that. And what happened is uh, basically um, with, with all those people mixing together, that's how we get the Samaritans, the Samaritans. And, and that northern tribe becomes Samaria. Uh, after that, those northern 10 tribes, that area is Samaria. And the 10 tr northern tribes are lost essentially at that point. But the southern two tribes continue on. They're Judah. And uh, eventually, the Babylonian Empire comes to power. They're the next ones after the Assyrians. And they come and they lay siege to Jerusalem. And there's three separate times that the Babylonians show up in Jerusalem. Uh, the first one is in 605, where Jerusalem first becomes kind of a vassal state. And, they, and that time, they just carry off some of the young nobility. Like, and among them would have been Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That was the first time, but they didn't do a whole lot of damage. They just expected tribute after that. And then uh, in about 601, there was this um, major battle between the Babylonians and Egypt, and the Babylonians lost in a big way, and their army was decimated. So all these um, vassal states of Bab Babylon tried to revolt, and amongst them was Judah. That did not end well for Judah, actually, because in 597, uh, after they stopped paying tribute, Babylon decided to pay them a visit. And this time they took off 10,000 of the most skilled laborers and brought them to Babylon as slaves to work there. Well, later on, once again, uh, Judah decided to try to revolt again against Babylon. And in 587, they came and they laid siege one more time and they said, we're done with this. And so they destroyed the walls, they destroyed the temple and everything. And they took most of the inhabitants off to be slaves in the land of Babylon. And Daniel is, is kind of happening all in the midst of this stuff that's going on right there. And that, that Babylonian empire was massive, took over much of the Middle East uh, when it was in power. So the Babylonians figured something out. They, they kind of by trial and error, there were different ways that you could control people. And, and they said, well, first of all, they tried, let's, let's expel them or drive them out so we can have their land. The problem was, is they did that, but then they grew strong and they got mad and came back. And they go, that just doesn't work really well. They keep coming back and they're madder, much madder than they were the first time. And, and so then they said, well, what about just subjugating them? Let's just push them down and crush them and make them slaves and that kind of stuff. But the problem of pushing people down is they keep rising up again. And they're like, ah, okay, this is, is not working for us either. And so finally they settled on this option. They said, let's assimilate them. Let's tell them that if you become one of us, You'll be, you'll be able to have the best jobs, the best education. You'll have access to all those things. You just have to become like us. And this is the strategy that the Babylonians set in on. And, and, this is, and what they meant by that, assimilation, was you know, adopt the language, the dress, traditions, uh, social norms. But it also meant that you were supposed to adopt the Babylonian values, morals, and religion. This is where Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come in. These guys are probably 12 to 15 years old when this is happening to them. They're, they're taken from young noble families. They're brought to Babylon. And the Babylonians are going to try to assimilate them. So probably someday they'll send them back to rule in their own land as essentially Babylonians. And so... Um, 
when Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are taken to Babylon, I mean, life just changes for them in huge ways, right? They're, they're learning a new language. They don't get to dress the same. Um, they don't get to make much many choices for themselves anymore. I mean, all these things are just dictated to them. Uh, much around them has changed. And then it comes time to decide what to eat. And so what would oftentimes happen is in the Babylonian court, you know, they, they'd have very, very nice food given to the king and his people. So that was offered to Daniel and, and his friends and, and all the other young men from Judah and the other nations they'd conquered. And Daniel says, we can't do that. Uh, we, we, we're, we're choosing not to defile ourselves. Now, this probably means two different things. First of all, you probably know something about Hebrew dietary law, right? Where um, they can't eat pork and, and all those kind of things. So they're, 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 that, that's probably a big part of this. God said not to, so we're not going to, right? But there's probably something beyond that as well. The belief of the Babylonians was that it, with the king's food, it was offered up to the Babylonian gods, and whatever the gods didn't eat, the king got. So it worked out pretty good for the royal family, actually, with that. And the belief also was is that because the gods had partaken of this food, um, that it was blessed by them. And any strength that you received and blessing from that food, guess who got the credit? The Babylonian gods. So this is also an issue for Daniel and his friends as well. And so that's, that's where they take the stand and they go, hey, let's, let's just try something else, right? We're, we're, there's so many things that we can change. We can change our language. We can change the aspects of our culture, but we cannot violate God's law. Don't ask us to do that. And of course, you know the rest of the story, right? They were blessed and, they, and God's hand was upon all four of those young men that took that stand. Now, there's uh, some important lessons that we're going to learn from Daniel today, and this is the first of them, and these are in your uh, sermon notes if you care to follow along in that way. Those are located in your bulletin. And the first of these four things we're looking at today that we learn, this principle, is that it's important to distinguish between matters of culture or preference and matters of faith. Now, Culture and preference are slightly different, but they're related, right? Culture would be things like your language and your music and your art and things like that that make up a culture. And preferences are the things that you like within that culture, your favorite color and, you know, that kind of a thing. And, and those are good and it's important for us to have. But there's also matters of faith that are things that are, uh, we didn't really decide, right? And, and, and matters of faith for us as followers of Jesus are things that are eternal, right? Things that God has said. And he said, you know, this is my word, and this is who I am, and they're things that we don't want to change. And Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul, understood this distinction, and it was very important. And what he would do, when he would go to different cultures, he would say, I want to try to become like them in any way that I can. I'm going to do whatever it takes to become like people to reach them short of sinning. And so he says, to the weak I became weak. To, and for, for those who were under the law, became like one who was under the law. And he goes on and on about saying, hey, I'm doing all things, so I become all things to all men so that I might save some, I might reach them to become followers of Jesus. And so that's this principle we learned from Paul, but it seems like Daniel and his friends were doing the same kind of a thing there. There were certain things that they could go along with and certain things they couldn't, certain things that spoke to God, that spoke about God and his, his will. Now, I think an important way for us to look at this, uh, one way to look at this anyway, is that there are things that are written in stone and things that are written in stand. And the things that are written in stone are those things that must never change. And for us, it's, it's like a stance on God's word, right? The Bible is God's word. We don't have the authority to change that. It's authoritative in our life, right? And so if we find culture in the Bible agreeing, we go with the Bible. Uh, God's nature doesn't change. And we could make this list of things that don't ever change. But then you look at there's this other list of things that are, are cultural, and we find that our faith um, can actually work in several different languages, right? That there's, and different people speak different languages, and they're still called Christians. And there's different types of music that people can, can use depending on their culture. And, and we know that um, you know, we don't all dress the same. Right? There's just different aspects of culture. And we say those are things that shift around. And, and, 
And those things should change from place to place. I mean, aren't you glad that we're not like locked into a, like a certain technology, right? We didn't say that was written in stone. That would be very bad for us. No iPhones, you know, any of that kind of stuff, right? If that was something that never changed. And so we want to make these distinctions as followers of Jesus, the things that can change and things don't ever cha- that don't ever change. And, and w- wouldn't you agree that there's a difference between... Um, you know, if, if we suddenly decided to add another book, like we're reading from the Bible and the Koran, right, that, that would be one kind of change, and changing the color on the wall would be a different kind of change, right? We're, we're, we're going to make a bigger deal out of about one than the other, hopefully, right? Hopefully, we'd make a bigger deal out of one, because one changes the substance of who we are, right? If we started reading out of another book besides the Bible, that would change who we are. We would change, we would mess with the things that are written in stone versus if we just change the color on the wall or we do a new song or a new worship style. Those are things that can and should change over time. And it's important for us as Christians to be able to distinguish between those two things. The second thing that we notice from Daniel uh, is that um, we distinguish between respect and acceptance. Respect and acceptance. Now, Daniel said, I'm not going to defile myself. And I think that's probably like the key verse for all of Daniel. He's, he's choosing not to defile himself in any ways. And when we think about these terms, uh, respect versus acceptance, um, I want to talk to you about a shift that's gone on in our culture. Now, it's related to the word acceptance, the word tolerance, right? And, and this is something that, that we, we use differently as a culture now than we did 30 years ago. It used, tolerance used to mean that, that I, I disagree with you. You know, we don't, we don't agree, um, and, and I believe that, that I am in the right, um, though I'm, I'm willing to be at peace and I'm willing to work with you, right? I'm willing to, to tolerate that. But there's a shift that's happened to where now tolerance in our culture generally means the same thing as acceptance. And the belief is that, that it's, it's not okay to say that, that we disagree, and it's not, it's not really okay to, to actually take a stand on certain things. You're actually just supposed to accept them and say that, that all things are equal. And this is part of something else that's gone on in our culture called relativism. And it's this belief that, that really all, all of our all of the things that we believe and think are, are that all ideas have equal merit. That's what, that's what people would say. And so that when this is applied to our faith, the idea is that, well, you know, Christianity and Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism and Judaism, they're all kind of on the same, the same um, level. And we, we don't dare say that our truth is right and theirs is wrong. You can't say that because they're all supposed to be equal. And that, that's part of um, what's, what's happened, a shift in our culture there. And as Christians, we go, you know, we can respect people of differing beliefs, and we can respect people that, that don't share our fundamental understanding of right and wrong and, and sexuality and all those other things. We can respect them, but we don't have to accept it. We don't have to call it right. We don't have to say it's no big deal, because we believe God has spoken to these things and he's done so in a way that was eternal. The God who knows all things, who, under, who put all things together, has spoken in, a, in such a way that it's meant to be true forever, not just in one culture, but it's meant to be true in all times and all places. And so as Christians, we want to have respect, but we don't have to accept everything. We don't have to uh, even believe in toleration as, as our society has redefined it. We don't have to do that but we, we're always called to respect and to love people who have a different view. And this is, this is what you see in Daniel, right? Did, did you see Daniel out there on, on, the, um, on his soapbox condemning all the Babylonians? No, that's not what he did, is it? Right? He was respectful, but he said, but nevertheless, I'm not going to believe what you believe. I'm not going to go along with that. The third thing that we learn is that if you have to choose between following God and following the ways of men, Always choose God. So in the book of Acts, Peter is uh, preaching, and and the Jewish officials come to him and say, Peter, don't do that. If you do that, we're going to throw you in jail. Um, don't, don't, Don't keep talking about Jesus. And Peter says, well, you're asking me to make a choice between obeying you and obeying God. So guess which one I'm going to go with, right? So Peter says, I'm going with God. We have to obey God rather than men. 
And this is something that, uh, that was understood by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel. There's this time in their life. This was shortly after one of those revolts we talked about, uh, where several nations rose up against Babylon, that King Nebuchadnezzar decided to erect this giant statue, and he called in all of his rulers, including the ones who rebelled, at least the ones that were still alive, and, and, their, and their replacements, and he said, you're all going to come to Babylon for this wonderful dedication ceremony of this statue, and when you hear music, you're all going to bow down and worship the statue and essentially, you're going to swear loyalty to me and to the Babylonian gods. Ready, set, go. And so the music started. And just imagine this. Thousands and thousands of people gathered around. Everybody bows down except three people. You think they're noticed? <laughs> they're going to stand out, aren't they? And, and so there were some people that, that didn't like the fact that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were kind of climbing in the ranks of, of the Babylonian Empire. And so they said, hey, king, did you notice that when you play the sound, right, when you play the music and everybody's supposed to bow, those three guys don't do it. And so the king who liked them says, all right, I'm going to give you a chance here, guys. We're, we're going we're gonna to try this again. All right, everybody get ready one more time. They said, wait, 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 king, don't, don't, don't do this because... No matter how many times you've rehearsed this, I, we're not going to do this because um, we believe that our God can and will save us. And even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down. That's not something we're going to do. Essentially, they're saying we're going to obey God rather than men. And, and so what, what happens is the king is not real happy about this. And he says, okay, well, then you're going to be thrown in this furnace and so the three of them are bound up and they're thrown in, into the furnace and the king takes kind of a, 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 another look and says, wait, didn't we throw three of them in there? But how come I see a fourth person and he is like the son of the gods? That's his own words, the king of Babylon's own words. He's like a son of the gods. And, and, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were in the furnace. They didn't burn up. And so the king says, well, why don't you come on out uh, now that you're warmed up? Come on out and we'll uh, talk. And, and he's, he acknowledges God. He says, wow, uh, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is a pretty, pretty powerful guy. And, and actually Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they all get promotions after this as well. And God, God's glory was seen all throughout in that, that, that gathering of people all from all nations, or at least all the all area around there, they saw what God was up to. So later on, Daniel is an old man now. He's actually uh, on a, in a, living in a whole different empire now. It's the Persian Empire. And the king comes up and, uh, it, well, actually, pardon me, some of his officials, um, they, they look at Daniel and they say, gosh, this guy has way too much power. You see, Daniel was one of three guys who were running the whole, Bab whole actually, this, this time I think it was Persian's empire. He was one of three guys running the whole empire. And um, so these guys who were jealous of this, of this Hebrew running things said, hey, we're never going to get Daniel in trouble um, you know, on a character thing. He's just, he's not dirty, he's clean. We, we can't find anything on him. The only way that we're ever going to get to him will have to be related to his God. And so if we get the king to make this rule, right, and you heard about the rules of the laws, right, the laws of the Medes and the Persians, once it's decreed, it cannot be changed, right? And so um, they get the king to make this rule that, that nobody should worship anybody else for this period of time, and they know that Daniel's not going to go along with it. So they, they're watching. Daniel bows down to pray to his God, and they're, gotcha, gotcha. So they bring him to the king, and the king is not, doesn't like this because he loves Daniel. He's very valuable, a good friend. But the king says, Daniel, i gotta, I got to throw you to the lions because that's what the law that we've made says. And so he throws him in there. Daniel does pretty good. God closes the mouth of the lions for the night. The king runs there the next morning. And the king probably doesn't do that just for anybody, right? He, but he runs there the next morning. Daniel's still alive. He says, Daniel, you come on out and let's find those guys that made that law and we'll throw them in there and see how it works for them. And it did not work the same way as it did for Daniel, for them. And, and once again, Daniel, Daniel's God gets the glory. Um, God is shown as, as powerful in the midst of all these things because Daniel also chose to obey God rather than men. 
And this is something for us to think about too, that there are increasing challenges to living out your faith in the public sphere, aren't there? That there are that if you work for the government, there's always new policies coming down, and and some of them are are squeezing more and more um, the the things that you can say and the things that you're supposed to do, and many of them are are contrary to the things of God. And many of the businesses that you work for, too, are putting policies in place that you go, gosh, this, this does not really mesh well with my faith, and how far can I go and, and not, you know, not disobey God but, uh, and, and, and keep my job and all, and all those other kind of things that are in there. This, this is a growing challenge for believers in our country, right, right here in our community, that, that there's shifts that are going on. And it's important for us to be able to, to figure out what does that look like, right? What's that look like to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow my leaders in any way that I can. I'm not looking just to rebel for the sake of rebelling. But when it comes down to having to pick between you or God, I got to go with God. That, that's a challenge that we're having to face more and more as Christians. And the final thing that we're looking at this morning is just to remember that we're sent by Jesus to connect a changing world to an unchanging God. And this is part of our, our vision statement as a church. One of the things we believe God has called us and sent us to do, but it's not something we thought of. It's something Jesus said, actually, and that's where this comes from. So it's Jesus. He is at the Garden of Gethsemane at the night before he is crucified, and he's praying this prayer. And, and the prayer is, is really fascinating to me because it's of all the things he could have prayed, this is what he does. Let, let's read this together. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Two really interesting things that, that Jesus does there. He says, well, Father, I, I'm not praying that you would like, you know, just take all of my disciples up to heaven the minute that I go so they don't have to face anything hard or, or anything like that. That's not what Jesus prayed, was it? He said, I'm, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world. I'm just praying for protection for them. And then Jesus says, and Father, as you have sent me, I am sending them. I'm sending them into the world. I'm sending them into the world. And I think that uh, while, while Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not have the benefit of Jesus' direct words, I think they got this idea, that they were there as a witness to their own people and to the Babylonians in the midst of all the things that were going on. And you and I are also called to that same thing, to, to be a witness in the midst of, of a culture that does not necessarily know God. So this last week, I was uh, with some, some pastors and leaders, and we were um, training uh, and doing some leadership stuff for an organization called 5-2. It's a church planting network that we're part of, that we support as a church as well. And... Uh, we spent one morning at a Benedictine monastery as we were uh, doing some spiritual retreat kind of thing for these guys. And uh, we worshiped with them, and it was a great, great experience, neat, neat thing, neat experience. But on the way out, I was reminded of why Lutherans and Protestants don't have monasteries. You ever think about that? Yeah, why Protestants don't have monasteries. And it comes down to a lot of what Jesus is saying right here. A monastery is a wonderful place where you can put aside, you know, a lot of the, the struggles of the world and um, there's just, you know, distractions and all kinds of things. You can focus on God with, without all the, a lot of the other things that, that kind of crowd in and uh, make life tough. And I bet you would probably go, you know, if I could like take my family, I think I'd become a monk or a nun, right? There's probably a lot of you that probably say something like that. It'd be nice just to leave all that behind and go live on a mountaintop and that'd be kind of cool. But here's the thing. The reason Protestants don't do this has, has to do with what Jesus said. You're supposed to be in the world. You're not called to be out and, and away from all the pain and all the heartache and all, all the things that are hurting there. You're, you're called to go into a broken world. And you're, and you're called to be his representative there. 
and, and to live a, a life in such a way that people see Jesus. In fact, here, here's what Jesus said. Let's read these verses together. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, if you know the Bible, you probably also know that Jesus said of himself, I am the light of the world. And this is kind of interesting because he, he's, saying, he, he's saying, I am the light. And then he says to his disciples, you're the light. And you go, how's that work, right? How, what's, what's, what's going on there? And I think it has to do with this. First of all, you don't have light in and of yourself, and neither do I. And what this world needs is not more of you and not more of me. What this world needs is more of Jesus. And when Jesus is saying, you are the light, he's talking to people who are following him, people within, in which he already dwells. And friends, when Jesus says, you're the light of the world to us today, it's because he is living in you. And what they're seeing is Jesus Christ in you. And as we follow him and we become more and more changed and transformed by Jesus, guess what people see? Less of you, more of him. And friends, that's what the world needs. People who live like Jesus. People who honor him, who walk with him. That's what we strive to be. That's what we strive to do. And while the world watches, pray that they see Jesus in you. Pray that they see him in you. That's why you're here. So this morning, there's really four things that we looked at, four principles of living out our faith in the midst of a, of a culture that, that does not often support it. We said the, the first thing was to distinguish between culture and preference and matters of faith. We, we got to do that because we can't, not everything is as big a deal as everything else is, right? There's a difference between those things. We want to distinguish between respect and acceptance, right? We can respect all people, but we don't have to accept all ideas as equally valid and true. And if you have to choose between following God or the ways of men, we always choose God. And this is going to be tougher and tougher for us as our, as our culture moves away from a biblical uh, center, and finally, remember that you are sent by Jesus to thank the changing world to an unchanging God. That's, that's part of your calling as a follower of Jesus, to let your light shine, to let his light shine in you. Let me pray for you. Lord God, when we talk about these things and these principles, Lord, it's, uh, it, it's, it's easy to listen to, but Father, when we try to actually apply them in real life, it's, it's kind of tricky sometimes. So, Father, we do pray for wisdom and for courage as we seek to, to honor you and our faith. Lord, we rejoice knowing that even when we fail, Lord, you still love us and you forgive us and you call us to, to get up and, and try again. And so, Father, um, Lord, just watch over us, guide us, let us live for your glory and point people to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. This morning, as you go, I encourage you to take advantage of, of our prayer that we have to offer. We have, we'll have somebody back in the prayer room and somebody at the stained glass window if you'd like to some prayer this morning. And also, remember, next Sunday is, is Daylight Savings Time. It's that Sunday again. This is the hard one. So please come to the 1045, not the 1145 service next, next week. <laughs> May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.